Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, this morning, we are going to continue with what we started on a Sunday, which is entitled um, uh, Faith versus Fantasy. But before I do that, I, I got some things I want to set, set us up with, with some scriptures so that we can be of the same mind and understand what God is saying to us uh, when it comes to this revelation. Now, I'm going to tell you right off the start, as I believe I may have emphasized on Sunday, that this is really a strengthening of your faith. This is a renewing of your mind. Uh, from time to time, I have asked that you set aside some of the things that you learned or I've asked you to reconsider some of the things that you learned. Just, just don't push them away, but listen very carefully to what God is saying through me and reconsider some conclusions you may have come to. All of us are asking God how we come to a place where we are stronger in faith and we resemble Christ on earth as Jesus did. And we want to know how we do that. How do we come to that? The Bible gives us clues. You come to that by renewing your mind. When Christ was on the earth and walked with his disciples, he told them to keep his word, to adhere to his word, to hold fast to his word. And if he, as, as they hold fast to the word of God, their eyes would be opened. So they can see the love of God and also see themselves in, a, in the light that God sees them. Not to think of themselves as being separate from God, because you think of yourself as being separate from God, you miss the revelation of the whole picture. And the whole picture is that we're one with God, and God was, is one with us. And there's no level of difficulty uh, with miracles, especially in this life, if we learn to look at this life and, and our role in this life from the proper point of view. If we have the proper point of view, the proper viewpoint, we will understand what appears to be a problem, what the solution to that problem, and how to set that aside for the truth. So I just want to remind us of some things, and there's a mindset that you have to be in. So in Psalms 82 and verse 6, it says, I said you are gods. I said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Now Jesus came saying that he was the Son of God, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Sadducees, Pharisees and Sadducees, um, all opposed him, talking about you. You make yourself equal to God when you say that you are the Son of God, and that's one of the things we today are still struggling with: the idea that we are sons of God, and just that the declaration makes us equal to God. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 23, it says, Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil. All right? You are gods. So you, you, we are missing the power that has been uh, attributed to us or inherited in us by us being from God, by us being God's creation, by us being God's children. And in, and in uh, John chapter 10, verse 34, it says, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. So his whole point here, I believe, not, not his whole point, but I think one of the major things is, you have authority on earth as God has authority on earth because you're equal to your father. As your father has authority, you have authority as well. So, uh, and Peter tells us that grace and peace will be multiplied to us as we come into the knowledge of God and his son. So as we come into the knowledge of God and his son, grace and peace is multiplied to us. We will begin to understand, okay, our, our function in on earth in time and how we are teaching ourselves as well as our sisters and brothers what the truth is. And as we awaken to the truth, this world comes to an end by replacing this world with the reality that is right before us. But because of the blinders we have on our eyes, we can't see what that world looks like. So I, so I, I entitled this, you know, I, I entitled this Faith Versus Fantasy. And then God slowly began to unveil to me some things uh, that... 
I didn't even hadn't even considered, and this has grown into something kind of large. And what the Lord has said to me through the Spirit of God, you wanted the title, so I'm, I'm illuminating to you what all this title uh, encompasses. So I want you to pay attention as we, we build a platform moving toward how we replace our fantasies with faith. You know, Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. What does that mean? How do we do that? And why is it very important that we keep the faith? So I wrote in my notes, um, I really didn't get to, um, in Genesis 2.21. In Genesis 2.21, and the Lord said, and, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his, his ribs and closed up the flesh in his place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now, uh, you will notice that in these two verses, uh, and nowhere else is it ever said that God awakened man out of his deep sleep. So as he caused this deep sleep to come upon man, he took from his rib, and he made a woman and presented it to, to him all in his sleep. And there's no place that he's told Adam that um, awaken to, to your new reality. This is your new reality. He has not told us to awaken. Again, remember the time. These are wise men as God has revealed himself to them, given oration to people listening so they can get the idea of how all of this comes about. With their vocabulary limited or expanse, that God showed them some great things, and now they got to articulate it. That's always the challenge of the teacher or the orator, is to articulate what God has shown them in their spirit to those who are listening, who may not have the may not be tuned in to the revelation of God as they are. So they got to use words, examples, parables, stories to get this truth across. Now, going back and forth to the scriptures we read, that you are God's prole. Then you have in Genesis chapter 1, Elohim, which is God, in the prool. You know, there's a plurality. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. So now you have man in the image and likeness of God. But what we see in mankind, we see a fallen nature. We see nature that gets sick. We see a nature that doubts God, rebels against God, rebels against each other, causes war. That's not God. That's not his reality. And we got to realize that it, later on in Scripture, it reveals to us that God is not a man, that he should lie. He's not a man. He doesn't take on these physical characteristics or personalities that we have as, as physical men. Now, but we are spirits. We are, we are the spirit of man. And we are spirits in the body. And in the body, God's creation, God has created us holy as he is holy and eternal as he's eternal. So his child wanted to know, well, what would it be? We in this bliss, we in this, there's no opposite. Would it be any different not to have all of this? Just a wonder, just a thought. And that thought caused a, a whole new series of things to happen for us so that we would have an experience of what it'd be like or what it's like not to be conscious of God. And now, even in your present state, there's no really conscious awareness of God. You have to walk by faith so that you will realize the consciousness of God. Now, everything that you're experiencing in this body can seem extremely real because you don't know your power. You think that, that some of the things that you're experiencing either come from God or come from an, uh, an adversary of the God. The fact of the matter is, all of the things that you experience, good and bad, comes from you because you're God. But anyway, as that verse of scripture we just read revealed to us, all right, actually, uh, it is while a man is still deep in sleep. That, no, I don't want to read that. In First Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter one, verse three, from the Mirror Bible, it says, "Let's celebrate God. He lavished every blessing heaven has upon us in Christ. He associated us in Christ before the fall of the world. Jesus is God's mind made up uh, about us. He always knew in His love that we would present that He would present us again face to face." before him in blameless innocence. That's written and read from the Mirror Bible. And I like that translation. Before all of time began, before there was anything that we know as this world and this earth and this situation that we've been experiencing, God had already associated all of us in Christ. He named us, called us holy, set us aside, blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Mine's already made up. You know, it also revealed to us in Scripture that God says, I know my 
thoughts toward you. I know my thoughts. My mind is made up about you. We have to accept not the false teachings of religion or the false teachings of men who, who are still guilty because they have not recognized that this is not real reality. <laughs> this is a dripped up reality that in real reality, none of us is falling from God. We're still in the bosom of God. We're in a protective place that he calls a deep sleep. And once we understand that, we can begin to order our lives differently, moving toward an, an awakening in ourselves that brings us the, Father, the Father's face clear so that we remember ourselves. All right, so we have to want that. We have to move in that direction. Amen. We have to move in that direction. So now, I think that we, and when I say we, humanity, uh, fail to remember that God is eternal. And all his decisions are eternal. He, his, his will is eternal and all that come from him and his, and his uh, will is and are eternal. There is no variation or change in him or his creations. There is no variation or change in God or his creations. We are eternally blessed. We are eternally holy. Now, we're in a situation that we may not understand. But as God is, is, so are we. All right? Um, <clears throat> so, in an instant, in this deep sleep, the Father brings to Adam a woman, and the fantasy is set, and it begins. Now here, it says, The betrayal of the Son of God lies only in illusions and all his sins are but his own imagining. And when I talk about the betrayal of God, remember in Ephesians says that before the world, God had associated us in Christ, his son. So some of us think that because we are not in that state of mind, there's a betrayal that's taking place. There is no betrayal. It's all a part of your imagination. His reality is forever sinless. Your reality is forever sinless. He need not be forgiven, but awakened. In his dreams, he has betrayed himself, his brothers, and his God. Yet what is done in dreams has not been really done. It is impossible to convince the dreamer that this is so, for dreams are what they are because of their illusion of reality. Only in awakening is the full release from them, for only then does it become perfectly apparent that they had no effect upon reality at all and did not change it. Fantasy seems to change reality. That is their purpose. They cannot do so in reality, but they can do so in the mind that would have reality be different. So if you want something different, if you're accusing yourself, if you say, oh, I'm no good, da, 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 that's not your reality. But if you want that to happen, you will have the illusion of what that means. That's the power you have. Uh, so let's think about this. There is really no reason to be angry with oneself for betraying the Son of God. With the revelation that we are here because we choose to be here because we wanted to know what it would be like to exist outside of the total bliss and wholeness with God and the Son of God, guilt and hatred for oneself would try to enter into our belief our feelings about ourselves. The betrayal of the Son of God lies only in our illusions, our dreams, and his sins are but his own imagining. Our reality, which is God's reality, is forever sinless. We need not be forgiven, but only awakened. It is in our dreams that we have betrayed ourselves, our brothers, and God. Yet, what is done in dreams never really happened. You say, well, Apostle Weed, I'm feeling things. And one of the things that we, we walk by faith, remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says we walk by faith, not by sight, and, and the proper rendering of that verse is not by our senses, past experiences, whatever somebody else has told me, we walk by faith. That simply says that what is said to me by God is what is really real. The truth is really real. I cannot trust my senses or my experiences because God is not a man. And I can't uh, 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 um, contrast God to mankind or to my behavior, to the behavior of somebody else. 
That is no way to know God. That is no way to know God. And whenever we refer to ourselves, for example, we refer to ourselves as a human body. For example, how do you feel? Well, now I've got to check my body, right? Because my body feels. So if I don't feel well, I'll say, well, I don't feel too good today. You know, I have the flu, right? Or, or I'm, I'm, I'm having pain in my body. I'm this, I'm that. So you are referring to and identifying with your body. Your body is not your identity. Your body is not your identity. Now, you might have to write that on a piece of paper and see it every day because this is something that you have to conclude about yourself. You have to say this to yourself. You have to rethink this, reconsider. I am not a body. That's why I say this over and over again. I am not a body. I am free. I remain as God created me. And that is something you need to say daily. I am not a body. Now, you will have reports about your body. Your body will, somebody will tell you that your body has asthma. Somebody will tell you that your body has high blood pressure. Somebody will tell you that your body has arthritis. And when you accept these truths, you are going to have the pain because you have accepted the, the word as truth. Now you need to justify it. You need to justify it with pain. You need to justify it with shortness of breath. You need to justify it. Now the body is replacing God. You know, when I talk about special relationships, we, we have special relationship with our bodies. So the body is replacing God. Now the voice of the body becomes our God. The voice of the body begins to dictate uh, my preview or my estimation of myself. If I feel really good and I feel really uh, strong, then I can say with confidence, I am strong. I am whole. Based on what? The body. But that changes. So if that changed, so will my confession about what I am. But if I have faith, I have faith that God, I am what God created me, not what this body says that I am. Before your ego uses the body against your faith in God. So you are siding on the side of fantasy because there's only one reality and that's God's reality and not on the side of faith. Don't feel bad. I didn't say that to accuse you. I didn't say that to make you feel bad. I'm saying that that's all of the condition of humanity. All of us that walk in the body, live in the body, have to live in the body by faith, okay? Because we all in the body has chosen to be here, but God has not forsaken us, neither has he left us alone here, okay? All right, good. It's not good for man to be alone, and God has not left us alone. Um, talked about that on Sunday, I don't want to review that today, but here we go. It is then only your wish to change reality that is fearful because by your wish, you think you have accomplished what you wish. This strange position in a sense acknowledges your power, okay? This strange position acknowledges your power. You have power to resist the truth and make a new truth for yourself. That's how much power you have. You have power to do that, right? It is, <laughs> it is, uh, let's read it again. It is, it is this, then only your wish to change reality that is fearful because by your wish, you think you have accomplished what you wish. The strange position, in a sense, acknowledges your power. Yet by distorting it and devoting it to evil, it also makes it unreal. You cannot be unfaithful or you cannot be faithful to two masters who ask conflicting things of you. What you use in fantasy you deny to truth, yet what you give to truth to use for you is safe from fantasy. You're either holy or you're not. You're not sometimes evil and sometimes good. You're either good or you're not. But we have, we have divided ourselves and our attention to try to be obedient to two different masters that have that is, that is conflicting because they're asking two different and conflicting things from us. Remember the scriptures encourage us, be ye holy. Why? Because he who made you is holy and he only made you after himself. 
If he's holy, you holy. No, there's no discussion about this. Oh, but apostle, I don't always act holy. Who cares? That does not have, your acting has nothing to do with the truth. You have to understand that you're fantasizing not being holy. Your eternal truth, eternal means without end, y'all. It never, ever ends. There's no contrast to it. You will never, ever stop being holy for God. And you've got to have faith in God has made you holy and have declared that, you're, that you are holy. So one of the scriptures I want to use here is found in Luke chapter 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one all right, and despise the other. You cannot serve God or mammon or wealth or the world's whatever you want to stick there. You cannot serve God and mammon, the scripture says, are the pursuit of wealth. Now, a lot of times we think that if we were very, uh, 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 we was pursuing wealth, we would be very, 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 very uh, happy and God would use wealth to bless us. Hmm. It says, first seek ye the kingdom of God and the fact that you're right with him or his righteousness in all things, which you call wealth, is added to you. Why? Because they were created by you and for you. You don't have to pursue something that was created by you and for you. It was created for you. You're supposed to have it. There's nothing, you know, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. It's already been given to you. Why are you pursuing for something that's already yours? It's that delusion that makes you separate from your blessing. You already have. So I receive from God all that he has planned to give me. Back to these notes. When you maintain that there must be an order of difficulty in miracles, all you mean is that there are some things you would withhold from truth. You believe truth cannot deal with them only because you would keep them from truth. Very simply, you lack, uh, your lack of faith in the power that heals all pain arises from your wish to retain some aspects of reality to fantasy. If you but realize that what it is, I'm sorry, realize what this must do to your appreciation of the whole. What you reserve for yourself, you take away from him who would release you. Unless you give it back, it is inevitable that your perspective on reality um, be warped and uncorrected. Next part. As long as you would have it so, so long will the illusion of an order of difficulty and miracles remain with you. For you have established this order in reality by giving some of it to one teacher and some to another. And so you learn to deal with part of the truth in one way and in another way the other part. To fragment truth is to destroy it by rendering it meaningless. Orders of reality is a perspective without understanding a frame of reference for reality to which it cannot really be compared at all. So he says, cast all your cares upon him. All is all. Cast all your cares upon him. Why? But he cares for you. Don't hold anything back for yourself to solve or for yourself to complete. Cast all cares upon him. Think. You that you can bring truth to fantasy? Do you think this? You can't bring truth to fantasy. It's impossible. So cast all your cares. One of the things that I've, I've said in these notes, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to get right down to it, is you can always tell when you are listening to the voice of your ego or if you're listening to the voice of God. And, and how you can tell that difference is whenever a situation, a problem, no matter what it is, a report from a doctor, a report from your finance, your finance advisor, report on television, whatever seems to give you some type of concern. You just simply turn to the Holy Spirit and say, what is this? And what is this for? Now, now easily, the first uh, thing that the, that the ego is going to say is, I don't know what this is. And I don't even know what this is for. But then it's going to go on to say, but man, I don't want this to happen to me, and I don't want that to happen to me. You know, I don't, might not know what this is or what it's for, but I don't want these things to happen to me, right? 
So that's the ego because he doesn't know. And then the ego is going to either talk to other people and they're going to talk about their past experiences or you're going to remember your past experience and think that what's happening to you today has something to do with something that happened that you did in your past. There is no past that affects your present. So the best thing for you to do is, is I don't have a past. I only live in the now. It's a continuation. Time does not compare or contrast to eternity. I am eternity whole. I'm eternally blessed. I'm eternal. I'm eternal. I'm eternal. There is no past. There is no future. That's the now. That's the best way we can even know in our concept of consciousness what eternity looks like by living only in the now. Not sun up, sound, sundown. That's one day. Sun up, sundown. That's another day. Not looking at the calendar. Not looking forward. Not looking back. There is no past. There's just now. So just throw that thought in the trash can. That was not God. When the Holy Spirit answers you, it'll tell you what the problem is. It'll tell you how to apply the problem appeared. And it will show you at the same time the result or the outcome or your deliverance from it. You say, well, pastor, do you have anything that can help me with what you just said that I can read in the Bible? Yes, I do. I am so glad you asked. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There has been no test, trial, or temptation. And all you have to do is substitute that, no test or trial, with the word problem. There has been no problem. There is no problem that is not common to man. Your spirit has no problem. You only has, have problems and concerns while you are in the body. Outside of the body, that problem, that concern does not exist. So, so everything that comes as a problem, as a concern, is because you're living in a body. So there has been no test or no problem that has come into your consciousness while you're in the body. That God is not faithful not to allow you to be tested or not to allow no problem to come upon you that you're not already equipped to handle. When it presents itself and it makes itself known to your consciousness, with it, the answer is there so that you may be able to bear it. The only reason you can bear a problem is because you know your way outside of it. You don't bear a problem by bearing it and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. No, you, you, you it come, you get rid of it at the same time that it came because you give an answer to it. You give an answer to it. With the problem, there's the answer. With the problem, there's the answer. So when you ask the Holy Spirit what this is, He will tell you what this is. He'll tell you what purpose and why it came in your life. And He'll give you the answer. He'll show you the outcome. He'll show you the meaning. When He shows you the meaning, the meaning release your faith. Because as soon as you know what something means, you automatically release faith, which will release your conduct and your attitude toward that problem. And as far as you're concerned, that problem doesn't exist. You don't acknowledge it because the real truth is what you adhere to. I hold on to the truth and the truth that I hold on to, the reality that I hold on to makes me free. I will not fret. I will not fear. Because I threw all that on the God. Who cares for me? It's not my problem. It's his problem. And he's faithful to take care of me. I don't take care of myself. I don't save myself. I can't save myself. God is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my comforter. And he's only going to talk to me about what God has told him to say to me. You know, a lot of time, a lot of time, a lot of time, a lot of time, time. So there will be a part three of this because it's very important that we continue this discussion in part three, which will be Sunday. So if you have anybody that's not that's watching us on, on Facebook or YouTube, make sure you tune in for the next part of this. We're going to finish this. It's very, very important for all of us, including myself, to hear and add to our faith walk with Christ. Well, in closing, I want to thank you for giving your tithes and offerings. And again, I want to acknowledge how you do that. You go to www.nccfc.net. Hit on that donation uh, tab, and when you hit on that donation tab, you can leave a, leave a tithe offering or a donation of love at that on our website. Or you can go to Zelle by going to, uh, by going to your Zelle and wanting to give a tithe and offering, and just address that to sisterweed at yahoo.com. That's our church account, and leave your tithes and offering, uh, uh, or give us your tithe and offering or gifts of love through Zelle. Or you can also 
um, go to the mailbox and you could <laughs> I'll write a check, a money order, put it in the envelope, address that to the New Grace Christian Faith Center at 2851 West 120th Street, Hawthorne, California, 90250. Those are the ways that you can give for the support of this ministry. I thank God for those who God has touched your heart to be a giver, to be a tither, to be a partner with us, uh, a life partner with us in the ministry that we're doing. For every soul that is saved, because you're partnering with us, that account goes to you as well. So thank you for your partnership with, with us. Until next time, I want you to remember that God has plans for your life. And none of those plans include